10 years. Can you believe it's been 10 short years since I started my YouTube channel? I certainly can't. Yet here we are. I joined YouTube on April 2008, and here we are 10 years and over 9,000 subscribers later. Although, I really should have more than that, and even I don't know why that is. 10 years later on. Where has the time gone? So what's with the name Call Dude Clem? I mean, I made a YouTube channel about electronics, and I called it Call Dude Clem. Well, the thing is, when I started my YouTube channel, it wasn't going to be an electronics channel. It was going to be a showcase of my cartoons and my music that I'd done. So if you look at the first videos I ever uploaded, you can see they're my cartoons. And there's some other random stuff in there as well. Still up after all these years. I'm not sure why I have so few subscribers. Maybe I should verify my channel. So, you see a little check mark next to my name, maybe that'll draw in some more potential subscribers, I don't know. I mean, I've got the option to do it. But I don't have a cell phone. Because I've never needed one. So if I do that, I'll have to borrow someone's... I don't know why they just cannot do it by email, like everything else is, but... Yeah. I mean, the name Call to Clem originally came from when I went to college. And, yes, I have been to college. But anyway, one of the school buses would stop by the college, so we would get on that bus and it would take us to and from college, along with, you know, me and a few others. And the other kids on the bus, they had this nickname for me, and they called me Cool Dude Clem. And that's basically where it came from. But it just somehow, a couple of years later on, just evolved into an electronics channel. Had I known that was going to happen, I would have called it something more appropriate, and I think that's the reason why I started Call to Clem's Electronic Workshop. And I regret, to this day, that video that I made, it's still on YouTube, but it's unlisted now, where I said that I would be closing Call to Clem's Electronic Workshop biggest mistake I ever made and I'll never ever forgive myself for that. Anyway, we're gonna go behind the scenes of Cool Dude Clem's Electronic Workshop and behind the scenes of the cartoons so you can see exactly the kind of work that goes into my videos and I think that will be a good thing for the 10 year YouTube anniversary video. Right, so I think the first place to start would be the equipment that I use. Now, you might have noticed that the audio sounds better now. That's because I'm using a different microphone. Before, I was using a lapel microphone that I made, and it really doesn't sound all that good. I have to roll the audio off at about 300 hertz, or it just sounds absolutely terrible. It's all boomy and ugh. But right now, I'm using a dynamic microphone with my homemade microphone preamp that I designed. And as you can hear, it sounds a lot better. Anyway, speaking of microphones, here are the three microphones that I use. So, on the left is the microphone that was used to record this very voiceover. In the middle is that lapel microphone that I was talking about. I usually had that stuck to the wall and had that recording the sound and then I had to do all the processing to it. And on the right, the newest edition, a microphone with its own built-in preamp. And you can see the little microphone capsule sticking out the hole there. And that is going to be used for the future Cool Dude Clem's electronic workshop videos. Now to record the video, my four babies. On the left we've got a security camera, which I don't really use that much, but it's there if I need it. The only trouble with that is it only has composite video out, so... I have to connect that to a capture device and then connect that to the computer, but, you know, it works. Then we've got my main camera here. It's got a little bit of an issue with the autofocus. It doesn't always get it quite right, but I've got something coming that should fix that. Then we've got my backup camera, which is there just in case I need it. And last but not least, the webcam. 
which is a little bit temperamental, I don't know if that's the right word to use, but I thought it had died one day because it wasn't working, but it just turns out that the USB cable on it is a little bit dodgy. Oh, and if you're wondering why the picture quality right now is absolute sh**, well, it's because I'm using my tablet as a Wi-Fi webcam so I can actually film these. And the camera on that isn't very good, plus I think I hold the record for the world's slowest Wi-Fi. I mean, look at this. <coughs> I'm transferring some files, and look how slow it's going. Which is kind of ironic, because I think I hold the record for the world's fastest wired connection. Well, I probably don't, but it is pretty fast. So here is what it's like when a Cool Dude Clem's electronic workshop video is being made. You can see one camera filming most of the action. Then there's the webcam filming what's going on on the scope. And the microphone to capture the audio. Now originally, when I recorded the sound from a separate microphone, I would record onto tape, which could be cassette or reel-to-reel -reel, depending on what I preferred at the time. Then I would digitize that onto the computer and I would use that sound file in my video. But that wasn't without its problems. So it would start out alright, you know, everything would be in sync, but as time went on, the audio would get more and more progressively out of sync, and it's as if the playback was at a different speed to what it was recording at, so that's why I switched to digital recording. As you can see right here, got Audacity recording the audio, along with the camera recording the video. And then later on I can just sync those up in the video editor and I don't lose sync recording onto the computer. Okay, so you've seen what I used to film Cool Dude Clem's electronic workshop, so let's take a look at some of the tools. So, on the left we have my LC meter, which is for measuring inductance and capacitance, and this rather sinister looking device next to it is just a thermometer. Then we've got where all the action takes place, the breadboard, where I build up circuits and test them, but of course I'm going to need some way of knowing if the circuit's doing something. Seeing if something blows up or catches fire is one way, but using a multimeter gives me a much better idea of what's going on. Then we got my semiconductor tester, which tests transistors and diodes, so I can find out which leg is collector, base and emitter and so forth. And of course, something that no electronics workshop should be without, a soldering station. Now I used to use a simple soldering iron, but when I switched to a soldering station, that was it. I've never looked back. And on the top of that is a spoil of wire and a little single board oscilloscope. Now this thing here is an old camera lens, and although it's very hard to show this on the video, this makes a really good magnifier. With this thing I can see all those tiny details really close up, really well. This is my main oscilloscope, and one of my most prized possessions. If something happened to that, I would be devastated. Next to it, we've got the signal generator, and on top of that, just a few of my components. Um, this is just a fraction of the stuff I have. I've got boxes and other stuff full of electronic parts. Here are some more of them, and if we take a look in the shed, as you can see here, even more stuff. It's absolutely crazy, and I'm still on a quest to get even more stuff, because I like stuff. And finally, one thing I forgot to show in the video, which is why I'm doing it now, is my homemade power supply. It's got two outputs. One of them is a single rail output, which will give me up to about 13 volts. And the other one is a split rail output, which has ground and positive and negative, and that will give me up to about 24 volts, and between the positive and the negative themselves, I can have up to about 48 volts. So should the need arise to test something with a voltage that high, I can certainly do it. But at the end, when all the footage is ready, I convert the files in virtual dub, and if I'm working with footage from my HD cam, which is most of it, I will use the field delay effect, because when I come to the final deinterlacing, it thinks that the video has been interlaced bottom field first, when in fact my camera records top field first. So the field delay fixes that. 
And for footage from the other cameras, I will just use Virtual Dub's area based de interlace. That is, if it needs de interlacing, of course. Doesn't give the full 50 frames a second, but doesn't really matter. Also, I set the frame rate to 25, and I use the FFD Show encoder, which is very buggy on Windows 7. But it looks like this time it's actually going to cooperate. So with all that done, it's ready to be edited. So you've seen Audacity in action, and you've seen Virtual Dub in action, so what do I actually edit my videos on? Well, here it is. Adobe Premiere 6.5. And I've had this video editor ever since 2003. Now when I first got into digital video editing, I would edit my videos on Windows Movie Maker, on Windows Millennium Edition, so you can imagine how well that went. But when I got Adobe Premiere, I never looked back, and it's been my video editor of choice ever since. The only problem with this old version of Adobe Premiere that I've had laying around for pretty much forever, is that it will not run on anything newer than Windows XP. I do have a custom installer that will install it on Windows 7, but it's very buggy. It gives me these bogus low memory errors, when in fact there's plenty of memory left, and the load and save doesn't work. However, on Windows XP, it runs absolutely flawlessly, so Windows XP it is. And despite the age of this video editor, I can edit full 1080i video pretty much effortlessly. So this is my workflow for editing my videos. First, obviously, I import the files into Premiere, then I put them on Timeline, and then I have a lot of fat to trim out. You see, I pause a lot in my speech, and I'm always saying the wrong thing, I'm always getting something screwed up, so there's a lot to take out. So what I do, I use the razor tool to mark where the audio and the video should be in sync, then I chop up the audio, and I take out all those long awkward pauses where I've had to stop and think to regain my train of thought, I put that all together, I trim out what I don't need from the video portion, and I've got a nice smooth flowing video. And for things like titles and captions, well, I just use MS Paint. I mean, it's there, it's simple, it's effective, so why not use it? And of course, I can do green screen compositing to overlay the text on top of the video. And for the more flashy looking titles, I'll use, well, Flash. Because I don't have Photoshop and I'm useless at GIMP. So anyway, when that's all done, I render the video as a motion JPEG AVI. I load that into Handbrake so I can do the final conversion, which is the file that I will upload to YouTube. I set the frame rate to 50. I use the Bob filter, which will deinterlace the video to the full 50 frames a second. And I just let it get on with it. And we have a brand new video to upload to YouTube. Anyway, that's that part over, so now let's move on to the final part of this video. How I do my cartoons. Okay, maybe I shouldn't be playing God, but it just gets so lonely out here in space that I made this machine that created you. Wait, we're in space? Right on. Take a look out the window. <gasps> oh, wow! That's so cool! And this is my space station. Pretty groovy, huh? Awesome! So, how was this done? Well, here it is. Adobe Flash with the same scene you just saw. And as you can see, even though it's done in Flash, everything looks hand-drawn because, well, it is hand-drawn. I cannot draw with a mouse to save my life. But I like it hand-drawn anyway. I think it adds a kind of a retro charm to it. But as for my mouse work, you know, drawing with a mouse? Well, this is about the best I can do. You may be wondering what my actual name is. Well, how about you? It's the same name as my YouTube name. Yes, I 
illegally faced by Nate the Colton Quam is a whole crowd because I hate Colton Quam so much I am dedicating my entire life to hating on him. Also, I had the ghost matter to do since I am a sad user of no life. Now just like real cartoons have all the layers drawn onto transparent cells to make up the scene, or at least they used to, the same thing goes for the stuff I do in Flash. So I'm going to turn off all the layers, then re-enable them one by one, just so you can see the construction of a basic scene. So first off we have a little bit of white background, then a tail, then a character looking out the window, or at least he would be able to if he had eyes, which are on this layer, then his mouth, and some stars, and to cover up where the stars should not be, a copy of the window, and finally, the audio track. This is quite a simple scene though. Most of them have more layers than this. Anyway, let's turn off all the layers again, and this time, turn them on, but this time from the top down. So, there's the window, some stars, a mouth, eyes, red, his tail, and the background. Now, as for animating, I have two choices. I can either do tweening, or I can animate frame by frame. Tweening is good for simple stuff like things moving across the screen, but for the more complicated stuff, I will need to animate frame by frame. But, if I combine tweening and frame by frame animation, I can do even more complex stuff, such as a character walking across the screen. I mean, just look around, man. Everything is just so alive and beautiful here. Now, let's just disable everything except the layer he's walking on, so you can see this a bit more clearly. I mean, just look around, man. Everything is just so alive and beautiful here. Well, that makes it a little easier to see what's going on, but this is still hiding something. So let's take a look inside this symbol, which is this little guy right here, and see what's inside it. So this is a symbol. In this case, it's a walk cycle, and it's been done frame by frame. And as you can see, it has its own timeline, and in this case, nine layers. And on each of those layers is a separate drawing. So if we add that to the total number of layers in this project, that gives us about 13, which is still nowhere near the record for the amount of layers that I've ever used in the project. Now, if you're wondering what's going on on layer six, that's the mouth animations, which I had to do separately and keyframe them in every frame. That way, I could keep the mouth moving along with the character as he walks and talks. I mean, just look around, man. Everything is just so alive and beautiful here. I mean, just look around, man. Everything is just so alive and beautiful here. Speaking of making a character talk, the way I usually do it is the head has several different frames with the mouth in different poses, and then I will just keyframe at every syllable, and on each of those keyframes, I will select the frame that matches what the character is saying. You look kind of different. It's the shape-shifting thing I do. I didn't want to freak out the natives if they see me, so I made myself look like them. Anyway, what do you think of this place? I promised you we'd visit a planet one day. I think they call this planet Earth. And if you're wondering about this stuff that's off to the side, well, that's just there so I can quickly grab it when I need it rather than having to look for it in the library and then put it onto the stage and then resize it and everything. Having it right there on stage, out of the shot but ready to use, just makes everything a lot easier. Now, for the stuff you don't see, you may think that all I need to do here is make this little guy fall into the bag and everything is good, right? Well, no. So if we take a look at the symbol of him falling, you can see that in the last few frames, I cut his head off, and his bum. But there's a good reason for that, because if I didn't do that, it would look like this. Now, as you can see, he clips through the bag, and that's not supposed to happen. Okay, so let's take a look at another example, which I call the transformation. So, 
That looked pretty interesting, but how was it done? Well, there are two symbols playing. One where his body disappears from the middle outwards, and another one where his new body appears from the middle outwards. So putting those two together looks like this. And to cover up the seam, I put in these stars, which also look good. Invention? What invention? But sometimes flash alone isn't enough. Sometimes I need to do green screen compositing, like you can see here. Invention? What invention? There's nothing here except trees and stuff. Oof. Ow. What the heck? So, we've got our green screen background, and all the animations for the character. So there's one where he's walking, one where he puts his arms up, one where he's walking with his arms up, and one where he crashes into something invisible. The only thing that's missing is a background, and here it is. So all I need to do is put these two together, which can easily be done in a video editor, and we have a completed scene. Invention? What invention? There's nothing here except trees and stuff. Oof. Ow. What the heck? So that just leaves one question. How do I get hand-drawn pictures into Flash in the first place? Well, it's very simple. First, I scan the picture, enhance it in paint.net, then I open it in MS Paint and save all the individual drawings as separate files, then I import them into Flash, spread them out, and this is the important bit, break apart. This way I can remove parts of the picture that I don't want, and rather than just erase all of the stuff that I don't want with the eraser tool, I can use the magic wand tool, which will take out the paper background with a mouse click and a keystroke, just like magic. Which I guess is where it gets its name. Magic. Although there is some crud left over, but that's easy enough to remove. Then all I need to do is convert those into symbols, because symbols are a lot easier to work with, and it's a lot harder to fudge something up. And finally, let's give him a mouth. I have all of those saved as a separate file, so I can use them again and again and again when I need them. So, I'll just copy this mouth, because it seems the most suitable. Back to our character. Open the head symbol. Let's just give it a few frames. And paste in the mouth, and there we go. Of course, that can be rather tedious, importing everything into Flash as and when I need it. But I don't have to. Because if I've got something already made that I want to use again, I can copy that from one project and paste it into a new one. He looks a bit lonely here, so let's give him a friend. There we go. And as you can see, it's also copied over all the required stuff. Well, I think that just about brings us to the end of this video because it's getting rather long and I think I've covered just about everything. Now stay tuned, there are more episodes of Cool Dude Clem's Electronic Workshop and more episodes of the Star Kids just around the corner. I hope you've enjoyed watching this 10 year anniversary of my YouTube channel and until next time, goodbye. Okay, now i just got to say my outro in front of the camera. Well, of course, well, we would if I didn't have all these interruptions. That'll be a good outtake to add to the end of this thing.